Phillips is like one of the great new young tenor saxophone players and composers in jazz today. And uh, he's been very uh, successful at forging a, a career. And I think that uh, I know you guys have a lot of questions to ask him. I do uh, along those lines and also about composition. Um, he was also a UNO student here, which was uh, a feather in my cap. Uh, and he has a new band uh, called Double Wide. And I know they've been playing around town. And, and he's been playing with also with John Patitucci and uh, uh, Charlie Hunter and probably a lot of other people that I don't know about. But anyway, uh, let's please welcome John Ellis. First of all, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I totally got seduced by the idea that everything is really close in New Orleans. <laughs> I got used to leaving an hour to go anywhere in New York and I was like, around New Orleans. Everything's like 15 minutes and I was like, oh, wow. The Legion Field is further than I remember. Um, thanks for coming. Hey, Matt. <laughs> And we do have musicians here available, you know, and yeah, we should music. definitely do all of that. We should do all of that. Um, uh, uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
You guys know back home in Indiana, which is basically Donna Lee. You know, Donna Lee, like the Stranger. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> um. So instead of playing it Donnelly like how we might normally, can we play that like a twelve eight, six eight sort of feeling? <coughs> Thank you. 
Maybe that's helpful. I mean, you guys sound awesome. Really good. That's cool. Uh, yeah. What? Oh, I'm just, man, I just, well, you know, things about your career also, but also about your compositions, you know, we've been kind of checking out some of your your composing, man. I, I just feel like, you know, you're one of my favorite jazz composers. I just, I just, when did you start composing? And then, you know, do you have any kind of process or any kind of, words you can tell to kids that haven't maybe delved into composition to get started mm. or you know to think about you know some ideas that they can they can uh, implement to get started mm -hmm. you know. I mean from my own experience I can say that composition is I mean the, the biggest enemy towards writing music is inertia <laughs> I mean honestly I think that once you're there writing it. It's like getting there is the hard hard part. You know, there's always something else, some reason why, and I gotta do this, and I'm like, oh, writing music, and what am I gonna write? And like, I don't know if I really should write. And if I, what is it about this thing that I'm writing? And, and everyone else writes so much better than me, and I, you know, just whatever things that keep you from the process of writing, I actually, I mean, for me at least, I find to be the biggest obstacles. I think that once sitting and writing, whatever your method, is, um, I think it, it's a process that happens, uh, and, and a lot of it is trial and error. I mean, for, for me lately, <clears throat> there's another thing too, a practical thing, which is that deadlines help tremendously, I mean, <laughs> really, truthfully, to, to that extent, because they, you can't let yourself off the hook anymore, it has to become a priority. So a lot of my writing deadlines have been self-imposed, in the sense that um, I write for albums that I make, you know, and so sometimes it's as simple as like, this is when we're recording, uh, let's book the time, you know, this is the band, this is the type of band, and then, you, you know, you write for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess from a, from a more practical standpoint, what's been helping me lately is to think, <clears throat> there's a whole lot of different ways to do this, but to, to think of the of the of the rhythm, to have a sense of the rhythm first, uh, because I think that uh, making some decisions about the rhythm you know, or the absence of rhythm or uh, helps sort of shape the what it is in a big picture way, like what kind of song it is. Uh, and I think it's also often forgotten when you sit at the piano, you start playing melodies and stuff. Sometimes you lose your way in terms of what the rhythm is what kind of rhythm it is. Um, and I find that when I've written something that I've liked and then forgotten it too soon to get it down, it's usually because my sense of how it fits in time is not clear. Uh, so uh, I guess lately in general, rhythm has been a, more of a fascination for me and, and more of something that I think is uh, important as something to lead you to everything else. So, and, and sometimes you won't, you won't naturally write certain types of rhythmic things unless you get yourself feeling rhythm first. You know, I was also always fascinated with the way that drummers would write. Um, so trying to see it more from that perspective. And, you know, that could, it could have to do with flow, it could have to do with how the eighth note sound, it could have to do with what kind of groove it is, it could have to do with what time signature it's in, it could have to do with, like, but sort of like getting yourself feeling rhythm now you're already engaged in like a process of flow. And you know, rhythm is where kind of the flow is happening. And once the flow is happening, then it's more likely maybe something starts to flow out. Um, and then having a, a lot of it too is I guess having, starting to develop a sensitivity to um, the, the emotional impact of 
syncopation and consonance and dissonance, you know, of melody, harmony, melody against harmony, like the, the emotional impact of these various choices. Um, and then starting to use your sensitivity to the emotional impact of cho chords and melodies and rhythms, starting to use that sensitivity like a palette. Um, it's sort of being aware of where you are and where you're headed and what color you're looking for and what kind of uh, tension you want to create and what kind of release you want to create and what kind of narrative quality. And I, I feel like you know, creating a composition, creating a solo even, the most satisfying ones have an arc. They have some kind of narrative arc, uh, which usually has to do with the way the tension builds and the way it releases. Uh, so, but there's a whole lot of ways to talk about strategy, but I, would, I guess what I, if I, I wanted to leave you with one thing about composition, I would really mostly say, don't let yourself talk yourself out of doing it. Because it, ultimately, I feel like the work comes from inertia, and the, the, defeating inertia. You know? Every other excuse you have to why you're not writing music. Most people I know who are engaged in the process of making music, if they allow themselves the time and space to write, will write something you know, interesting. It's, you know, and once you're writing, then it's just a matter of getting into a space of sort of not judging it. You know? uh, sort of allowing it to come out. Just being like, what, what is this? And also knowing that not everything that comes out is going to be something that you keep. Uh, but that you're just in there. like it's, it's, It seems so simple, but it really is like that. It's like a process. Which, which you said about setting deadlines for yourself, I think is really an important thing to address. Too, mm -hmm. Because I think that, um, I don't know, for me personally, you know, we're, we're all, you know, we're all part of this process in school where you yes. have to, you have sort of uh, deadlines and Imposed on yourself. Yes. You know? we like to try to keep to our deadlines. Yes. You know, and it, uh, and and it's it's usually imposed by someone else. Yes. But when you're in the real world as an artist, yeah. you have to impose that on yourself. You have to. Yeah. So you know, do you do that? I mean, is that is that something just part of your, um, you know, your, your development? You just have to say, well, look, I have to do this by this. I mean, I know you're talking about the record sessions yes. and stuff like that, but. Uh, how important is that to you? I, mean, I know you feel like a lot of people maybe uh, procrastinate because they don't set, you know, hard deadlines for themselves. I think that's right, and I think actually the accountability to other people is an important part of the deadline, and that's that's actually what you have in school, and what you have when you make a record, because that's what I said about booking the time first. Uh, if the only person you're accountable to, as far as the deadline goes, is yourself, you will inevitably not do it. You know, I mean, that's my experience. Being accountable to other people is really, really helpful for making this process happen in a way that you can't really procrastinate your way out of. And this applies to everything. It's like, you know, that's why having a personal trainer is better than having a gym membership. You know, you're much more likely to go. You know, it's just a thing. It's like having a, and and so, for example, you could hear at school even or, or outside of school, you could have a. a, 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 a a part, you could choose a partner and say on you know Wednesdays we're going to get together and I'm going to show you what I wrote and you're going to show me what you wrote <clears throat> and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're much more likely to do it because you have someone else you have a deadline and it's someone else involved and you guys know that you're both going to be like okay let's see what we you know co-writing is helpful in that way collaboration I mean for me it's it's mostly been uh, it's had to do with, you know I set a goal for myself to try to make a record every year of my own and I. I I try to write the music for those records, and uh, haven't achieved that goal. But at least I'm, I think having that as a goal gets me there. You know, it gets me closer. Uh, there's, I mean, the most interesting thing that happened to me on this, in this respect, is like a couple years ago, uh, Aaron, Aaron Goldberg and I produced the music for a children's book series called Baby Loves Jazz. And the guy who wrote the children's books <clears throat> was not a musician, but he's a he's incredible. Like at making stuff happen. You know, he's, just, he's always like, he's a total hot mess. Like he's, he's totally disorganized and chaotic, but he's constantly like, let's do it. He, he, he can't be defeated by the practical realities of, of, of stuff not working out. He's just fully optimistic, like, yes, we're gonna do this. You know, and he's always like overly ambitious and everything. Nothing ever happens the way he thinks it is, but it always happens much more than it would if it wasn't someone like him pushing it. So I love him for that. He's, he makes you very frustrated, but it's, he's awesome. So he, he did this thing from one of the books, it was a Christmas, one of the Christmas book. 
and he got the artwork done, and he had the sequence, he had the packaging done, everything. We were making records to go with these books. On the back, he had the track listing, you know, and it's like jingle bells and blah, 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 and it's like sounds of snow and something else. And so we haven't done any recording or anything. It's, this record is packaged and sequenced. So it's like we haven't done anything. So it's like, what is this sounds of snow? Oh, that's, that's you writing that one. That's one of yours. <laughs> and he got me thinking, like, and I, I, I intend to do it at some point, but I offer it to you too as something to try. How awesome would it be to, to make a record with a title and sequence and tune titles, everything? All the tune titles are done. And, it's, and even go so far as to imagine the artwork, everything. This is the title. So these are, you know, before you write a note, right? So you know track six is going to be, you know, in this case it was children, you know, giraffe song. Right? <laughs> and now you have a now you have a, a shape, you know. Now and now you also have like well, that's you know track six is it's already done. I know it's giraffe song. I just have to discover what giraffe song is, you know. And I think that as a as a it, it kind of blew my mind as a that I mean to me it's really attractive as a way to work, you know. Because I think what we end up doing we sit at the piano and we say oh here's the let me put my hands down and see where they come down, and it's like hmm now let me see where they. You know, and then it's like you get untitled tune number 672. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like to, to just start with titles. You know, like start with, and then it's it's fun. You know, it's like it's a game. It's like problem solving. It's like, what is, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Red from Birmingham. <laughs> Mr. Red from Birmingham, wild in New York. What does that tune sound like? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, to me, that's really fun. The, the most successful writing, as far as like really output that I had, was, was last year. And I, I worked with a, I worked with a playwright, with a collaborator, a playwright, and we had a, a narrative story and songs, and it was a uh, 60 minutes of composed music for 11 musicians, and it, and uh, I wrote the whole thing in about three months. But I, you know, I made these really disciplined strategies for myself. Um, I, uh, I mean, I get into another thing, but I intentionally didn't try to orchestrate for a long time. I just tried to deal in the realm of melodies and harmonies and rhythms. I didn't think so much about which instruments are playing what, which is definitely something you have to face when writing for more, more instruments. Um, which I find that's also very helpful too. If you're writing for a large group, uh, lots of instruments, I think the more that you can. Get the big picture shape of what the forms are and everything, and how everything's working before you worry too much about, uh, you know, does the cello play this line or does, you know, if you if you haven't really figured out what it is yet and you're thinking about who's playing what, um, I think you can get bogged down, you know, you can get lost in the details before you actually get the structure together. And a lot of great composers I, I read separated the tasks of composing and orchestration, and I think it, it it makes sense if you have to work under a timeline to do that. Yeah, I think it really makes sense. Um, you know, apparently, Ma, you know, Mahler did that. Like he would write in the he had the two seasons. You know, he would compose in one season, and then six months later, he would orchestrate. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how did you choose? Like your your group has a unique instrumentation. Yeah. Was that because of the individual people? Or was it the instrument? How did you choose that? Um, it was both, actually. Uh, I mean, the, the, the start of that project came from, I guess Matt left, but I, I did a gig with Matt Ryan on Sousaphone in, in the mid-90s, and uh, he, we were playing on, he, I think he was actually hired to play bass, and he had cut his finger, and so he brought the Sousaphone instead. And uh, it was a, an amazing experience. It was Herlin Riley and Johnny Adams before he passed away, and David Torkinowski was leading it. And um, Matt, I remember we were playing like, a bunch of New Orleans tunes, but like in seven, and then we did Groovin' High, and Matt was playing the melody with, with me, and I just remember being like, wow. Like, I mean, I had never heard a sousaphone uh, do that. So it kind of lodged itself in my brain as something I would like to do, like I would like to have a project specifically with him, because uh, it was, he was so impressive. And, uh, you know, about ten years later, I sort of started to put it together. So I, I knew I wanted two, but then drums was kind of natural. And the organ came... Just uh, that was more sort of about less about the individuals, you know, more about just 
one in the sound of the organ. Mm -hmm. uh, and one in the idea that the, that the organ can also play bass and the you know, sousaphone can play bass. So you have two different bass functional instruments. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, and the color, the colors that, that you get. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely think a lot about instruments and the character of the instruments in terms of writing to them, sort of how to, you know, how to, what kind of sounds sound good for, for, those, for those instruments. So that, that band just, was a fun like orchestration idea that I had. Well, um, and honestly, I didn't know if it would work, <laughs> like both instrumentation-wise and um, and pers personnel-wise. Um, I mean, the way that session came together is that I, I booked a studio in New York and I had the music and uh, and you know we rehearsed right before. I mean, I, it wasn't until the first rehearsal, but the, it was two days before the session. I mean, it was everything was people were flying, and you know at that point there was no turning back. Is that but it was a tremendous like, relief. <laughs> is that dance like there's no turning back? That's exactly dance like there's no. Exactly. Um, but I was, I mean, I was highly aware of the possibility that it might not work like, for whatever reason. <laughs> so, I, uh, you were talking about that gig you did that sounded real, like New Orleans kind of gig, and like Steve introduced you as a modern guy. Right. And how do you think, like, being here? And doing those types of like old school gigs, the normal world, the new world, the new world, the new world, as a preparing you moving up there. Yeah, I mean, everyone heard, heard his question. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. Uh, that was a long question. So I, I, he's asking about me living in New Orleans. Uh, he said, Steve introduced me as a modern saxophone player. Clearly, I had experience playing in New Orleans. How did that shape me? And how did it prepare me to, to be in New York? Uh, you know, I've always had like a really deep love for, for New York and New Orleans, but I'm, I'm from North Carolina, from a really tiny town, and there was a point when I was about 18 years old when I was contemplating going to New York or New Orleans. And I visited, and honestly, New York was just really, really overwhelming and, and scary. I mean, it was just like, I just didn't feel like I could get it together, like there. It was, it was super daunting, you know. But not just the music and the pace and the, the people and the, the city itself, the whole thing about what it feels like to be in a big city. And uh, down here, it was perfect for me at that stage because it was, you know, still a level really high, like a, a, a town with like such a great, strong musical identity of its own that actually is different than what New York has. Um, but small enough that, that like, someone like me could find a little, you know, to have some opportunities to play and grow, and, you know. And at the time, my priorities were definitely much more like very like trying to get the fundamental stuff together, trying to learn songs and trying to learn how to play the instrument and trying to learn how to improvise, like just the most kind of like fundamental stuff. And uh, I needed to come here first. I mean, it's, to me, it was like, it was absolutely the best best thing I did. And it still, you know, has remained because of that a place that I want to spend time in. And that, uh, I really want to um, provide, you know, I, I want to be like a cross uh, pollinator, you know. I want to help people in New York appreciate what is in New Orleans that's special and, you know, vice versa, I guess. So to me, they're, they're the two uh, most important jazz cities in the U.S. I mean, without a close third, for me, at least. And how important is it for young musicians to be in New York? Or do, you, do you feel like that's an important component for developing a career? Or? I do. I mean, I think it's the career thing is tough. I mean, ha having a career in improvised jazz music, I think, is extremely difficult and uh, shouldn't be ever uh, glossed over. Sort of like how difficult that is. Uh, and there's so many different competing reasons and factors of why that is. I think uh, part of why I moved from New Orleans to New York was that in '96 I was in the Thelonious Monk saxophone competition, and there was 13 of us that made it to like the finals, and 12 of them were from the Northeast, you know? and I was the only one who basically was from the South. Essentially, it was like Boston, New York, like everybody. Um, they weren't necessarily from there originally, but they were there then, and 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 it was like, and they were all amazing, you know. And I was like, wow, like I uh, would like to understand more about how they do that, <laughs> you know, like how to what that is. It was mostly just like I would like to improve so that that isn't so. There was a lot of it that was very uh, foreign and sort of like, wow. 
So initially, I mean, I moved there not so much about having a career, but just more to like improve, I guess. Um, and I think it's still, for me, it really is like that. I mean, it's, it's so, I mean, all the things that can make it terrible and rough are the kind of the same things that can make it amazing, which is that it's giant. There's way too many musicians that are all awesome. So it's very easy to get defeated by that. You know, it's very easy to be like, to not be able to find your place and to feel kind of, you know, out of sorts and to not make any money and to, but if you can figure out a way, to, I think, to frame it where it's less about being competitive and more about um, getting better, uh, and that you see those other musicians as your brothers, you know, like as your brothers and sisters, as your, you know, we're all trying to do this kind of really unlikely thing, uh, then I think that the, the potential to get to improve there and to hear people playing stuff that challenges you is, is probably greater than any, anywhere else, just because it's so big. I mean, it's, it's 10, 10 million people in New York City, you know, so... Oh, and it's a completely impossible place to really like make a living in the city. I mean, it's, the truth is that it's, it's gigs there pay probably less than they do here. I mean, you have supply and, and you have supply and demand working against you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, there's all kinds of unimaginable opportunities there too, you know, just to do all kinds of things that are, you know, different types of music and different types of touring. And uh, I guess your sense of what a life of music might Include grows a lot from being in a place like that. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's kind of like based off what you were just talking about. But when you were uh, like in high school, like in high school and beginning of college, um, what were you like aspiring to be in like the music industry? And uh, what was your motivation that led you to believe that you could be what you wanted to be? That like led you to go over the intimidation of the competition that's out there. That's a really great thing. I, mean, I think, honestly, my parents, in, in a lot of ways, prepared me for that. I and mean, I think some of this transcends music and just becomes about who you are as a person. Uh, I went to a performing arts high school called the North Carolina School of the Arts for four years, starting in 10th grade. So by the time I came to UNO, I had kind of been in a conservatory environment for four years. So I was also very fortunate for that. I mean, I had like a, a sort of very European style ear training and all that stuff when I was in high school. Um, and very organized, kind of classical curriculum, uh, which was really, really helpful. Uh, but I think, you know, being here helped a lot, you know, because it gave me a sense of being here and, and having some experiences playing and feeling, <clears throat> gaining confidence before I moved to New York was very helpful because once I was in New York, I felt like, you know what, I could always move back. You know, it, it wasn't like, I knew I could have a life that I'd be happy playing music, didn't have to be in New York. I think when you get when you start to be defined by New York, like it's New York or nothing else, I think that can be dangerous. I see, I see people get extremely dark there. Um, sometimes I think that that mentality leads you to that. Uh, uh, you know, when the truth is, no one really makes a living playing jazz in New York. I mean, I know that's maybe a controversial thing to say, but it, I, I really think for the most part they don't. Not, not playing. I mean, basically the, the most high-level guys make a living traveling outside of New York. They live in New York, but uh, and, I mean, quite, quite clearly, because if you're Herbie Hancock or John Schofield, or, there's actually a, you can't play in New York. Sometimes a, a, a venue that you play in will require six months of you not playing in New York as a part of the contract because of the money that you make. You know, so it's not like you can just casually be playing all the time. You actually can't, and that's why you charge a lot of money, so you, know, you may have your big, one or two big gigs in town a year. This is if you're like really, really famous. And the rest of the time you're, you know, whatever, you're on the road. You're teaching, you're playing, you're exporting this idea of New York jazz or jazz in general to the world, to the rest of the world. I mean, the jazz audience, for better or for worse, is essentially comprised of jazz students and uh, people from overseas. Uh, and what's interesting about how New York works is that most of the people who come to the big New York clubs, including the Village Vanguard, Blue Note, are the exact same people you play for when you travel overseas because they're actually tourists coming into town. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of like the, the audience is imported to, for, to, for the clubs in New York. Uh, and the music is exported to the clubs in the other places. I mean, it's, it's true. <laughs> uh, 
How much of your time is spent overseas as opposed to like touring around the States? You know, it depends. I, because I played with Charlie Hunter, I got a unique take on it because he actually had worked hard through you know whatever the jam band means or whatever that, that stuff is. But he's one of the few artists kind of in the jazz realm who had a really big following in the U.S. So we didn't go to Europe for like the first four years I played with him. All we did was tour in the U.S. And we went to you know, Bozeman, Montana, and you know, we played in Anchorage, Alaska. And, <laughs> I mean, but, you know, uh, almost no jazz musicians that are famous play in those places. You know? And we would play dingy rock clubs, and uh, we played all different types of venues, and it depended on the music. A lot of music for people dancing, and like, um, but his niche is very, it's really unusual. I mean, what he created for himself is like, it's hard to think of how many other people do really do that and still keep it kind of in the jazz realm because it, it really did have like a feeling of jazz a lot for the most part but it still somehow transcended the typical jazz audience and became like a young you know music for young people partying kind of so I think to the extent that you can have music for young people partying uh, you can tour in the US um. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right, Joe? <laughs> party for old people. Yeah, well, anyone partying, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but you gotta admit, it's not. It's young people come to your show. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, you're talking about classical music. Do you like draw a lot of inspiration in your compositions from classical music, or do you think it's important for jazz musicians to check out classical music? To just, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's important necessarily. Uh, <clears throat> these kind of questions are difficult for me because it was not, I mean, naturally, I think it's important to pursue what's interesting to you. Mm -hmm. um, Regardless of what it is. Yeah, and I think if you're writing music, uh, the more sort of involved the writing gets, I think the more naturally you'll, you'll gravitate towards mm -hmm. uh, great composers. You know? I mean, essentially the jazz composing... The small group jazz composing challenge is about, to me, is about making a vehicle that's inspiring for improvisation, which is a very different challenge than the classical challenge, which mm -hmm. is about creating a through composed piece with a narrative arc that sort of is yeah. in. And it's, so it's a whole different, I think it's a different kind of pursuit. And the, the composing part of it, I think they're both very difficult, and it's not necessarily the case that you can do both just because you can do one, mm -hmm. including like you could be a great classical composer and not necessarily know how to write for a jazz band where it feels right, you know, mm -hmm. just to have that thing where you play a song and you're like, oh, it makes you want to, like, as soon as the me melody is over, you yeah. like, can't wait to solo, you know, <laughs> and, and the whole band is feeling kind of, like, excited. Um, I think that's, that's a tricky thing, but you know, I think if you, once you get involved in writing more long-form, sort of involved comp compositions, I think most naturally will go to the, the great classical composers because... They did, they've done it yeah. so effectively. I mean, it's, and also, I think I had a teacher at, at the New School who was incredibly helpful for me in terms of helping you understand that. I mean, I think a lot of the most exciting future stuff is, is going to have to do with those barriers coming down where you stop thinking like classical is way over yeah. here on this other spot and jazz is like way over here on this other spot. And of course, there's lots of quote unquote third stream stuff, like since Gunther Schuller, where there's an interaction of the two. But uh, yeah, you can hear that I think there's a lot of like well-trained classical musicians that are starting to get much closer to the feeling of what jazz is, and I think there's a lot of jazz musicians who are starting to really be closer to understanding. And I think that's going to continue to happen. So I think, as far as some uncharted territory, I think that there's a lot more to do in that in that realm because I think a lot of what's been done sometimes ends up being sort of like you end up getting like these versions of music that don't have what's great about jazz or what's great about classical music. You know, you just sort of end up with some other thing that's sort of neither as good as either one. And I, I think there's an opportunity for that to change, you know, where, where there's like some something that really has what's amazing about both. And I think that's already starting to happen. I mean, I think that these boxes of this is this type of music and this is this type of music, all that stuff is starting to come undone. And, and the way my teacher got me thinking about it, I think if you're trained as a jazz musician, I think you're uniquely situated to, to be a part of that because if you don't let yourself feel like classical is this super stodgy thing that those guys over in that other spot do and they're all wearing powdered wigs, like, <laughs> if, you, if you start to think like, 
this is this is music exactly the same yes. as you know like uh, and and you just and, and you approach it in a hands-on way in the same way that you might approach jazz like if you learn I mean I still think the best way to learn playing jazz at the beginning is to listen and imitate you know for, there's kind of no way around that the only reason these guys can play group good is because they've done you can I can hear them immediately and know that they've done it you know it's just like there's a vocabulary there now there's no reason classical music can't be taught you can't approach it like that. You could go to the recordings and you can trans, you can play along, you can, you can, what's that voice and what is that, you know, mm -hmm. listen and mm -hmm. what is the orchestra, you know. Instead of feeling like, oh, now I turn off my jazz sensibility and I go to this other weird, super studied yeah. and stodgy and like, oh my god, I want to write for orchestra. I must, I have to take a writing for orchestra course five years long. And, like, instead of that, just being like, this is music, I'm getting in there. And that's how, honestly, that's how you learn. I mean, I did a lot of writing for strings this past year and it's like, the way you learn how to write for strings is, right for strings <laughs> you know it's like yeah and then once you've done it I mean I challenge you like do two weeks of like writing for strings just do it just like I'm gonna write for strings and then figure out the things like okay this is alto clef a few little things you gotta figure out and then and then get the Ravel string quartets and look at it and and listen to it and and you'll flip out you know it'll be mm -hmm. I studied sort of like study the Ravel string quartets in school in the sense that they played me a recording and I said oh it was like Ravel is like way over there in the past and Whatever, and it's and it's this canon of music that we've inherited. But when you start thinking like Ravel was a dude who sat at the piano and wrote this piece of music exactly like me sitting at the piano, it, something happens, you know, something happens to your thinking, and you start to really appreciate what what it is to do something like that, you know? <coughs> and also like to see when you really see the chasm between like, wow. But it's, I think it's very hard to have that appreciation without doing it. You yeah. know, it, it, like it, not the same thing as studying it, like, but, but like actually writing some stuff yeah, yourself. Instead of checking out yeah. everything. And you just have to know at outset it's going to be sad. I mean, it's like the stuff you first <laughs> write for strings is going to. I mean, it's it's going to be. It's going it, to. It takes time to learn these things, of course. You know, but like, it's hard to even appreciate what 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 it is. Mm -hmm. And you can obviously apply this to everything else. You know, I mean, this teacher I had, he had us write. Writing for orchestra the first day, you know, and it's, it was awesome. You know, it's just like, and rather than thinking like I can't do that and I don't know this, and then you just start writing. You know, it's just like, yeah, you figure it out. <laughs> you know, you start to figure it out as you go. Um, Trial and error. Man, it's just it's amazing. You know, it's amazing how much really comes out of that. Mm -hmm. It really does. It's like we think too much. You know, we we think too much about without doing. Thinking is important, but like yeah. doing and, and then thinking, <laughs> like and then being like, hmm, I want this doesn't work. <laughs> that's how you that's how you discover what you need to know. It's like okay, I'm gonna try to learn how to. Wow, I, no, I'm trying to do this, and now I realize that I don't know this. And then you say, hey Victor, you know, hey Ed, hey Steve, like I, I I I'm butting up against my the information that I'm missing. You know, I realized through doing this that that's something I need. And now you're ready. You know now. They tell you something and it helps you, you know? Cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was going to ask, because uh, um, we were talking about the colleges, uh, when you were coming to you know, yeah. uh, my school, what was like uh, a thing, or your most uh, uh, problematic, uh, I guess maybe technically or harmonically that you worked on when you came to UNO? And what was that? Did that ever like help you in other ways, um, or was would, 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 did you ever have a um, like? I mean, I guess I'm asking. But you know, what was your like? What did you work on? Like, what was one of your your, your, your uh, part of your practice? When I was at UNO, when I was at UNO, I mostly was transcribing and playing, like tr transcribing things from records and playing with people. And I think both were equally important for, for my development. I think one without the other would have been, wouldn't have worked so much. But th those are my two top priorities when I was at UNO, for sure. <coughs> um, I mean, I think what, what do you practice is an excellent question for just in general. You know, I, I've been spending a whole lot of time lately working on time, um, like incredible amounts of time with the metronome. So really slow. I think you can do that now. I mean, I think that's something that, that I kind of wish I had done that earlier. I think as a as a horn player, uh, 
it's so easy to not hold yourself accountable for the time and the form when you're alone. In a way that if you're a bass player or a piano player or a drummer, uh, you can't. I mean, you can't really do that. Um, you know, if a, if a drummer is going to practice, he's, he's working on time, you know, for the most part. He's working on touch, he's working on sound, feel, but I mean, essentially he's dealing with beat. Saxophone players, like, we, we noodle around, you know, like there's a whole lot of like, and some of that I think is essential for discovery, but I think I wish I had been more, I wish I had forced myself to play time more, because one, there's, I feel like the time is of the three elements of music, you know, rhythm, melody, and harmony, rhythm is, is the most important one, uh, by far, and I also think it's, can be neglected in a school setting because there's so much, uh, so much. Uh, it's so hard, it's so much information. It's like let me just see what, what are the changes and what are the scales and what are the, and it, it's you spend your time in this realm where you're really concerned with these kinds of things and you, you forget about the time. Actually, the time is like once I get this stuff together, then I'll put the time. I'll add it, you know, instead of like really, it's the time has to be first and then the other stuff. Yeah. And I think especially for for. For, for improvising now, I'm, st I'm trying to train myself as much as I can, but it, it's always about the time. It's always about the rhythm part of it. And then the notes, uh, I find the notes, you know, like the notes are, like I'm trying to play rhythms, I'm trying to think about rhythms, and I think like that. And let the rhythm lead the, the notes, rather than have the, because you can easily get stuck with lots of, even if you have lots of vocabulary that works, you can get stuck where that's the vocabulary. That's how you interact with the song, is by playing that vocabulary. You know, that's how you, instead of having a sense that the song has a rhythmic life that happens without you playing, and that you're interacting with it rhythmically. Um, you know, and that's something that can, you can work on a whole bunch. I mean, just like, I mean, if we're just doing, even if you're just doing, I've been doing Donnelly a whole bunch, by the way, like, the changes to Donnelly a whole bunch. All 12 keys, playing time, you know, and it's particularly, I've been, um, Spending a lot of time playing triplets because I think it's something to get comfortable, to try to get comfortable with. You know? So, I mean, it's just like a. It's just like, let's say we're in E major concert, you know, like. So, something like that. It's like, and you can stop, and it goes, you know, it's like still goes, and you just interact with it. So, I think that's, that's something that I spent a lot of time messing around with that. And I put the metronome on it. Um, you know, and so you, you get into like, and drummers do this too, they hang on like, you know, and then you get into like, so the form is happening, right? So you're here, right? And then... You know, you know, so you get into like, okay, what is the second triplet? You know, like, how can I play off the second triplet? You know, that's just like, sorry, I'm not switch it up. Uh, 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 uh,
Right? And then messing around with the, the third, like if I, if I can't take it by myself, um, you know, we leave the drummer alone all the time. You know, like that's part of the show. It's like, yeah, helpful. Like, extremely helpful. And then at a certain point, like, you go from being, like, really petrified of that happening to being really, like, like, wanting it to happen. You know, or, like, really being like, let me take it. I got it. You know. Johnny Griffin with Monk. I got it. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I think it's just, it's helpful. And, then, like, you have to, you have to hold yourself accountable to the time and form, you know, alone. Get it, <coughs> making the rhythm happen and joining it and, like, you know, once the tune is happening, the tune is happening. You're in there. Like some kind of practicing like that is just crucial. Yeah. You got a question? Oh yeah. You actually answered. I was going to ask about you know how we were hearing the triple meter over the metronome because when you were playing, you just stop and do the twelve eight thing. Right. You start it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to some extent, like having this kind of real revelation changed the way I read music, like. Um, I almost, I always look for the biggest beat that I can feel instead of, uh, you know, if you're playing fast tempo and you're like trying to count, like when you're reading, you're trying to count, da, 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 like it's impossible, you know. You have to feel it in cut time. I mean, I generally would hear up tempo swing stuff, I, I would kind of feel one, you know, honestly. Yeah. You know, like, and I think that that all of a sudden stops being so intimidated because now it's just like, oh, I'm just. You, anything to get you from that, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, you know, which is like how you feel playing fast. Like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna die, oh no! You know, but if you start to hear it, like, you know, it's like, It's just something about what it does to your, to your body, you know, to your language, to your, to your relaxation, you know, that you're just, as soon as you're like, oh my god, 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 it's like, and it feels like that, and especially when you're reading, if you're like, oh my god, oh my god, and so syncopations are like, oh god, how do I read this? You know, but if you start to be able to see it visually and realize that it's, and just sort of feel it against this, you know, or whatever the biggest beat you can find is, you know, oh. And also having a sensitivity to what it feels like. You know, where is the, the like, how's the drummer playing? Like, where is the beat? The, regardless of what it looks like. Like, what, what you know. Oh. Having that revelation change, it made reading so much easier for me. You know, it's like a little adjustment, and then you're like, oh, man, why didn't I think of this 15 years ago? <laughs> think, talk a little bit about when you, when you improvise. I mean, how you think developmentally. Because I know you got a real compositional mind, and, and uh, you know, you're talking about you know, trying to build an arc in your solo. Yeah. Like, I mean, what, what, what makes a good, what you think is a successful solo for you? you know? Wow. Or how do you think when you, when you approach, you know, you know, you, you know I mean, mm. you're talking about rhythm, you know, but what, how, how do you approach melody, too? Mm -hmm. Man, I saw it. Uh, okay, so I think at the, at the, the first thing that has to be said in answering this is that uh, improvising in a, in a jazz way requires a, a real kind of deep pursuit of the of the language itself, like of the vocabulary itself. So I think first and foremost, as a bass line, transcribing, learning things by ear, listening, that informs everything, you know, in a way that can't be ignored, like a sort of like bass. And then I think after that, like once you sort of, it's, it's sort of like learning a, I mean, it's like learning a language.